the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, and potentially even Credit Suisse, is sending shockwaves throughout the financial world. With assets totaling over $200 billion, the failures of these banks have been far reaching across the globe. So let's take a deeper look into the mistakes they've made and the potential solution. For years, these banks have been engaged in risky lending processes and overextending themselves in pursuit of growth. Their exposure to these high risk sectors has eventually led to their downfall and they've been unable to repay the mounting debt. In 2021 and early 2022, Silicon Valley Bank took roughly $100 billion and invested that into government backed bonds. Essentially, this meant that Silicon Valley Bank took a massive bet that the Federal Reserve was not going to raise interest interest rates as fast as they did. See, bonds like this are valued based on their yield, and in this case, Silicon Valley Bank was on the wrong side of the transaction to lose a lot of money. SVB and Signature Bank's collapse can be traced back to their aggressive lending strategies. They took on too much risk, and this ended in their demise. The collapse of these banks has widespread implications for the rest of the financial world, because now investors and customers of these banks are now questioning the solvency of the banks that they hold their money in. And this really really isn't great for confidence. The failures of both of these banks is a stark reminder of the dangers of excessive risk taking. It's very clear that these banks need to reassess their risk taking strategies to avoid similar catastrophes in the future. We're relying on SVP as our bank to move money um, on behalf of our payroll company into the accounts of our employees. The key question is, are those funds going to move as planned on Monday morning? That's uncertain. But the root cause of all of this is the Federal Reserve's suppression of interest rates. And it's led to this like mix mash or distortion in the marketplace. People have borrowed excessively, creating unsustainable debt levels. And remember, this isn't the first time they've had a crisis like this. So this is where in some sense, the crisis began. Yeah, this was the place where people were stumbling out of offices on the 15th of September 2008, the world having ended. The Midtown Manhattan headquarters of Lehman Brothers, whose collapse 10 years ago this week was the signal event of the 2008 financial crisis. The 2008 crisis was also fueled by similar policies, demonstrating the long-term consequences of these interventions. This is not the first time central banks' actions have led to a financial crisis. Banks like Lehman don't have deposits. What they do is borrow money from other banks. And that money runs faster than any depositor can run. The 2008 crisis was fueled by similar policies, again demonstrating how these policies have long-term effects. The central bank's policies haven't only encouraged excessive borrowing, but also led inevitably to a surge in inflation. And this has made the debt crisis even worse and made it even harder for these banks to maintain solvency. And all of this has put a strain on the financial system, opening up the environment to be vulnerable to these types of crises that we're seeing from Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Credit Suisse. Amidst this final chaos, a solution has emerged in the form of Ripple and its native token XRP. With its innovative approach to cross-border transactions, Ripple could provide the much needed stability and efficiency to the financial system. Ripple's platform enables faster, cheaper, and more secure transactions. And that revolutionizes the way money moves across borders because it actually unlocks the dormant capital in Nostro Vostro accounts. So you might be asking, well, what's a Nostro Vostro account? When you're looking to send money across border through your bank, the bank doesn't convert that money. They simply take your currency, hold that, and pay the recipient of your payment in their currency with money that they've held at the bank in that currency. So what you find is these banks have large sums of cash in all of these currencies so they can facilitate those payments. But Ripple comes in with this whole new system called on-demand liquidity, essentially allowing for a pool of this native token XRP to be used to dip in and out of for these banks. So let's run the new example of a new transaction through this system. You want to pay someone in India, for example. You give them your pounds or your dollars, it converts immediately into this pool of XRP. So now your pounds are in XRP. Immediately then after that, the XRP is converted into the native currency of the recipient. And the whole time, the XRP that you're using just gets converted back and remains in the pool. This allows for a massive amount of transactions and reduces the requirement, actually eradicates the requirement of Nostro Vostro accounts at banks. Meaning there can't be liquidity problems. Meaning <laughs> crashes like this won't happen. 
The market for global payments is immense, but its infrastructure is archaic. The challenge? Trapped capital at Ripple. We understand these challenges and have created an innovative payment solution that leverages the XRP ledger and the digital asset XRP. XRP is the perfect crypto for payments because it transacts quickly at very low cost with high throughput and is carbon neutral. But Ripple is a tech company and if we know anything about tech companies, they usually hold money in Silicon Valley Bank. And Ripple was no exception to this. But Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO, issued a statement about this topic. And he basically alluded to the fact that despite having some holdings in Silicon Valley Bank, the loss of these funds would not affect the day-to-day -day operations of Ripple. And of course, if you're invested in XRP, this was a nice sigh of relief, but it really just shows the resilience of the new financial system that hasn't come into place yet how resilient they are to the old system. And it just highlights even more how Ripple are perfectly positioned to take over. My name is Jay Lee. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder of Sempi, um, which is a remittance uh, platform out of, based out of Korea and now also in Singapore. Ripple is able to introduce us to um, countries that have more, uh, I would say, uh, superior products um, within those countries, uh, within the uh, Ripple network. And as the world grapples with the idea of the collapse of these banks, it's very apparent that the current financial system is in dire need of reform. Ripple and XRP could pave the way for a more stable and efficient payment process in this new financial system. Just like internet banking revolutionized the finance world. The evolution of banking. From trading shells for goods to sending digital currencies around the globe, developments in technology are reflected in banking. Right now, our wallets are being digitized, with payment information being carried on phones and devices instead. The speed and ease of managing money will continue to increase, with banking becoming more accessible around the globe. One thing is certain, wherever technology goes, money and banking will be close behind. Ripple and XRP are set to do the same in this new era. The question now is whether the world is ready to embrace this new technology. And I truly encourage you to dive deeper into the technology that Ripple offers and the native token XRP. I do a lot of that on this channel, but I mostly do that with my deep research and sharing my findings with my members on YouTube. If you want to be most up to date on the things that are happening, join our community of researchers on our Discord. If you don't know what Discord is, just go into the comments of this video. Let us know that you're interested in joining the community and we'll have someone respond to you as soon as possible. There's a lot changing all the time, but one thing I want to remind you to do is stay emotionless and I'll see you in the next one.